Welcome to the Speaking Podcast. You can find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com. My guest today, from Dallas, Texas, in the USA, president of the Renaissance Group, a real estate brokerage, consulting, and publishing company, expert in human behavior with an MS degree in psychology. He was the realtor of the year in Dallas, and he's also the author of the book, The Architect, The Architecture of the Real Estate Practice. Please welcome Sonny Moyers. Thanks so much, Roy. It's nice to, be, nice to see you and appreciate the opportunity to be on your show and speak to your audience. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to this because uh, just different things that I've looked about. So I suppose, I mean, I've touched on the different things, but you might just kind of let the listeners know a bit more about Sonny. Well, I uh, got into real estate very young. I was uh, going to Abilene Christian University, uh, playing football, and I was unusual. I had a wife and a child, and I needed the money. I needed a job. And so I went looking for an opportunity and got a part-time position managing an apartment complex. And uh, that opportunity changed when the manager walked into me and handed me all the checkbooks and all the money. In, in a pouch and said, I'm leaving, you're now the manager, and walked out. And so I was I was 20 years old and had never managed an apartment complex in my life, and Roy, I didn't even know how to balance a checkbook. So my, my next meeting was with the owner, who was a man named Dick Kendrick, W.R. Dick Kendrick, who was a realtor and a very wealthy gentleman in Abilene, Texas. And I went to meet with him the next day, and after about an hour of interviewing me, for whatever reason he chose, he, he's decided that I should be his manager and kept me on, and that's how I got into real estate. And he eventually helped me, sponsor me to get my broker's license and real estate license, and I've been involved around and in real estate ever since. When I graduated college, I went to um, work for a Fortune 500 company, Southwestern Bell Telephone and AT&T, in the marketing department, and Later on, went back and got my master's degree in psychology, human behavioral theory, organizational design, uh, some other sub studies within that, and um, been in real estate, I ride real estate my whole life. So that's how I got into it. Well, excellent. So I know, I because there was some of the YouTube videos that I was looking, and I think there was a kind of pivotal m moment as well when things weren't going so good that, you know, you kind of had to chat with yourself. You might let people know what went there. Yeah, I was uh, had a wife and a baby, and this was before I met Mr. Kendrick, and I was living in a little garage apartment uh, across from the university, struggling to survive. Uh, of course, I made a few mistakes along the way to get there, but I uh, had a little baby that needed uh, food and clothes, and it was a very cold winter evening, and I was in the alley outside of my apartment. And back in those days, many of your listeners may not know this, but Back in those days, you could return bottles and get a small deposit for the glass because they were reused. And so I was looking for bottles to sell to get money to be able to buy some things for the for the baby and my wife. And I looked up at God and I swore at God and a very unkind thing to do and immediately realized it wasn't his fault that I was in that alley because I'd brought myself there on my own accord. And I made a, a promise to myself that I would never again be in a position where I could not take care of my family. And that, that moment has fueled me and the way I work and the way I've lived since then. And quite frankly, I've often remembered that cold night and being in that alley, and it was a very dark moment in my life. Very good. No, but it's brilliant that's the thing with that you've kind of had that realization and you said never again. And I'm working again, you know. I believe, is there, your wife is involved with working with you as well, Leah? My wife is my partner in real estate. Uh, we had a very unique, unusual uh, unusual real estate uh, model, business model, which I'll refer to quite a bit in our discussion today. Our business model was residential real estate, commercial real estate, tenant representation in large buildings, and consulting. And my wife was the lead in the residential side, and I led the uh, commercial and the uh, consulting side. And then seven years ago, my wife suffered a massive stroke and had to retire from the business and it changed our business quite a lot. So now I still do real estate, but with very select clients who I've worked with before. And one of the reasons that I 
decided to write the book was to share with my uh, with the readers, with the audience, the uh, how to be successful in real estate because the business model that I created was quite I was quite successful in it, and I, I'm very grateful for that. But it became because I started out with a really uh, a business approach that was quite unique and different. And that's about a lot about what I teach. I've taught in 20 different countries around the world, marketing and sales, and I've traveled extensively. And my real estate business has been fun and enjoyable experience. Mm. Very good. And just curious, did, uh, like you mentioned your child when you were 20, did you bring any of your children into the business? You know, my, my daughter, our daughter, wanted to teach and to teach uh, pre-K kids. So, no, she didn't follow into the business. Our, our son uh, came to work for our business for a short period of time and decided that real estate was not for him and went on and went into banking. And so, no, I have two children and neither one of them have followed us into real estate. So uh, we've uh, not been able to hand it down to, to within the family. Which like a psychology that you've learned. Like, did you notice the difference of how you were applying what you studied in the business prior to, like, before and after? Uh, I think I think the concepts, we ha I have, I teach a lot of keystone concepts, concepts that are more universal uh, in in, in theory, and a, a professionalism is synonymous with value is a good example. It's a keystone concept that basically says that when see, people see someone who's highly professional, they automatically, intrinsically, without realizing it, uh, see more value. Now, what is professional to one person might be different to another, but my view has always been that with your audience, you seek to demonstrate professionalism and in order to do that to not miss anyone you have to appeal to the people who have the highest expectations of what professionalism is and that way you don't miss anyone uh if you if you dealt with someone and you, your view of professionalism was at a, a different level you might miss those people who had higher expectations now those keystone concepts are universal and those concepts uh uh apply whether in the beginning of my practice or at the end of my practice. And my, that's what my book is about, developing fundamental concepts, uh, keystone concepts that lay the foundation for a business. So to answer your question, the family being involved at different times didn't affect the way I ran the business because it was based upon some fundamental concepts and rules. Uh, culture, people define what is culture in a business. Many times it's the fundamental concepts, theories, and uh, uh, standards that you set for the business. So m most people talk about cultures, but they can't explain what culture is. And so when I say that, what I mean is what the culture of a business is how you structured it to provide the highest value to your clients and what standards of excellence and what standards of ethics you've set for that business. And then how you plan to operate that business, which is uh, another key component of a business model. And that is, how do you operate the business so that you uphold those standards throughout your life and through your business? And that allows a business to change with times and change with economies. And certainly, we've seen a number of ups and downs in cyclical real estate within the 50 years that I've been an agent and a broker. And so, we, that's how you can survive many different markets in different times. And for those kind of trying to find a decent broker, because... I had invested in Ireland. I got a few properties in Ireland. And I remember a lot of them were very poor at the job. You know, it was kind of like, you, you do your thing. In Poland, I was buying a lot of properties for myself and for other investors. And then I was developing as well. So like I'd done like 30 apartments. So we I, we got a few different agents. And I was actually selling a lot more than most of them combined. <laughs> because like I wouldn't force a sale if I knew it wasn't right for him I'd kind of be listening to him and talking to him but the amount of times that I would get an agent even if I was looking at a property they just opened the door and go one and that was it they wouldn't even it was like yeah exactly it was like so unprofessional and it was a very high percentage of that or even the follow up or even you'd be writing to agents interested in the property and they wouldn't even respond so well, well, let me, let me address that with you. Uh, I'd love to. Uh, the National Association of Realtors, which is the largest uh, 
agency or, or association of realtors in the United States. It's the, the big one. It's the, and the National Association of Realtors has a million five hundred and twenty thousand members, uh, and they're all like that's a loss, isn't it, for a population? What well, the population? Three twenty million or something? Three hundred twenty plus million. Uh, but but uh, Roy, there's three million agents in the United States. Now the difference between an agent and a realtor is you can be a licensed agent and you can sell real estate, but you, to call yourself a realtor in the United States, you have to be a member of NAR, National Association of Realtors. It's a licensing thing. Well, uh, of those million five hundred and twenty thousand agents, only four percent, four percent, in two thousand twenty-two made over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars net profit. Only four percent. So you can imagine most people perceive that if you're in real estate, you're making a whole lot of money. That's not the case. There's a whole lot of agents that don't make much money. In fact. Um, the 80-20 the rule of business applies in real estate very same way it does to many businesses. About, I would say, less than 20% of the realtors do more than 80% of the business. So when you just talk to find a realtor, just find someone and start talking to them, you're not likely to get the best or the one who's most client-oriented or client-centered. Uh, and that's why I have always said to people, when people have said to me, how have you been so successful in real estate? And that's my answer is that I don't sell real estate. I solve problems. Rory has a need, a, a situation where he wants to invest some money. He's got some money that's idle. It's not making the return on it that he expects. And he wants to invest that money someplace in Ireland or, or someplace else. And the, his problem is he needs to make to put that money to work. And so how do we best help him put that money to work? So I've never looked at it as a product sales business. I've looked at it as a consulting business and a collaborating business where I collaborate with people and I, I operate as a consultative salesperson. Okay. So just, just imagine, and I'm going to tell you a little story analogy of this so I can demonstrate to you what I'm talking about. Let's say you walk into a large hotel and a beautiful hotel in a large ballroom and there's 399 people there, okay? And they're all dressed the same way. Uh, let's just say they're all dressed in gray. And they all have the same expression on their faces. And they all have on their foreheads written, salesperson, okay? Now, one person walks into the room, and they are wearing blue, and they have a different look on their face. In fact, they have a look on their face that says, I would like to talk to you and get to know you. And across their forehead says, I care about you. Now, what I'm demonstrating there is the concept of differentiation. And one of the goals of a great realtor is to be noticed and to be found. And the best way to do that is have differentiating factors that make you different from the crowd of all those real estate agents. So one of the problems is many people, and it sounds like you might have had a situation you just picked out three or four people and gave them an opportunity and discovered that they were really product salespeople. They weren't really caring about you, your needs, and what you hope to accomplish in putting you first. A great realtor is successful by putting the client first at all times. And that means sacrificing commission sometimes by putting the, and being willing to tell a client, Roy, this is a nice property, but I don't think it meets your needs being able to walk away from a sale and not push something. And then, of course, the lazy person who opens the door and says, take a look, I'll wait outside while you look, and you tell me what you think, are you going to buy it? That's not the person you want. Okay? You want the person that will go in with you and tell you the good and the bad about that property, what the, what, and that's the true professional. So one of the challenges of a, of a, of a client finding a good realtor is to identify one who puts them first. By the way, that's one of the fundamental ethics of real estate. Put the client first. And then another one is that they demonstrate professionalism. So how are you going to identify a realtor? And hopefully in this interview, I demonstrate to you the difference between a great realtor and an average realtor by demonstrating proficiency. And demonstrating proficiency is one of the keystone concepts. You know, I can put up a, a card. I can hand you a business card that says multi-million dollar producer. Okay? 
Most people don't realize this, but when an agent sells a million dollars worth of property, they don't make a whole lot of money. They might make $15,000 for selling a million dollar property. So when they say they're a multi-million dollar producer, that doesn't mean they're highly successful. Okay? Second thing is that these sometimes these cards have on them a logo or something that says a designation. I'm an expert in a particular area. I'm a designated expert in relocation buyers. Okay? It's a good example. To get that designation, you go to a three or four day class. You listen to a bunch of lectures. You pay a fee to become fly, uh have that designation, and you you put, can put that designation on your card. That doesn't mean you're an expert. And demonstrating proficiency is a, that that logo, that little card that says I'm an expert. That is what I would call shallow proof. Real proof is in me demonstrating to you by demonstrating my proficiency by taking a property that you think you might want to buy and by giving you the positives, the negatives, the, the how I think the property will perform if it's an investment property and why it will perform and why it's a good bet and also uh, delineating for you what the risk would be in that property. And that's a great realtor. So if you meet a realtor who takes you to a door, opens a door and says, take a look, I would say, don't sign an agreement with that realtor. Yeah, don't let that person represent you because that's not what you're looking for. I hope I've delineated the no, difference. Absolutely. And when I did get the ones that I was, I went to the top five out of a hundred. <laughs> that just shows the level that, you know, it's like they, they have short term vision. You know, they're out to kind of catch people and then move on to the next person. They never well, that's right. Long term client, which is, you know, that's. Well, and let's just let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, you seem to be uh, uh, a young man compared to me, anyway. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm 51. Let's just say that you uh, beat someone who's 35 years old. Uh, I don't think either one of us are probably 35. But let's say you meet someone who's 35 years old. Typically, a client might buy, and not an investor, but a typical client who's owning a property to live in. Uh, they might buy or sell a home every five to seven, maybe maybe nine years. So if they're 35 years old and you can keep the relationship with that client for over 20 or 30 years, there are multiple transactions involved, and the value of that client is significant. So many realtors that are young and inexperienced and don't know necessarily what they're doing from a business model perspective look at a sale. I don't look at a sale. I don't work with a client by qualifying them for the purchase of the property. I qualify them for a relationship with me over a period of many, many years. And that value of that client is significant when you think of over their next 20 or 30 years. That's why I've been in real estate for so long. Over those next 20 or 30 years, I might have eight or nine transactions with you. Each of those transactions might yield fifteen or $20,000. So I'm talking about a value of a client of an excess of $150,000 or $200,000. And so when an agent looks at a client as a buyer, as someone who's going to buy a property, they're not looking at the client from a client relationship perspective over a long period of time. And that's why so many realtors fail. They want to sell a house. You know, I'll tell you a really good story, Roy, if you have the time for it. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. This is a young couple uh, relocating. I write about this couple in my book from Toronto. And by the way, I've changed all the names and the locations because I don't want to give away personal information. Uh, they were moving from Toronto and they came, met me at the hotel and they had spoken to me over the telephone multiple times. First time I'd ever met them was when I was picking them up at the hotel. And I went to the hotel fully expecting that we would go on a tour of, of neighborhoods and areas. Okay. And I get to the hotel and one of the challenges I had on the phone with them was these were a were very interesting couple, but they talked over each other all the time. You know what I mean by talking over each other? I'm sure you have guests who talk over you have to say a lot or, or, or whatever, okay? So when they talked, when it was very difficult to get to know them very well over the phone. But when they arrived, I met them at the hotel. And to my surprise, when I got there, they had a table in the lobby. And they said, please sit down. And they explained to me that they were going to continue to interview three people. And that I was the last person they were interviewing. 
and that they still hadn't decided who was going to be their agent. And so the, the young lady who was the buyer, uh, the wife, said to me, uh, I'm just curious that there are three really good agents that were highly recommended by people that we trust, that were recommended that we were interviewed. Why should we choose you versus the other two? Well, you can imagine my, I had to give a good answer, didn't I? And so I looked at them and I, I paused and I said, you know, I think the reason is that when we talked on the phone, you told me that you were coming here to live here for some years, but that you would probably move back to Toronto. Is that right? Right. Well, the reason you should choose me is I don't sell houses. I help you make a good decision. I help you make a decision that will be good for you financially and for your lifestyle while you're living here in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And then someday when you leave, I always think about what's the exit plan. How are you going to move out of a property, not just get into a property? And so they looked at me and they asked me another question. This was a couple that had, didn't have any children. And I had sent them a finding a home guidebook, which was a tool that I use in working with clients. When I, when I worked with someone. And the Finding Home Guidebook was a unique book. It was, it was probably 100 pages long. And they said, in your book, you talk a great deal about school districts, uh, choosing a good school district. But we don't have any children. Why would that be important to us? I said, well, it's, very, it's a very good question. But a very high percentage of people who move to our area have children. And a very high percentage of those people are focused on what the schools are like, what opportunities in the school districts are available for the children to grow and, and be, be successful in, in, in their lives. And so it's highly probable that when you sell your home, the person who's looking for your home is going to be very interested in school districts. So you should not buy in an area that has average or poor schools because your ability to resell the property down the road could be negatively impacted by that choice. They, they kind of paused and looked for a minute, and then the husband said to me, Sonny, I think we're ready to go. Let's go look at houses. Now, what I made there was a perception sale, Roy. I don't know if you've ever heard that term or not. A perception sale is a sale that doesn't necessarily make you any money, but changes the perception of the client about you and how you can help them and how you can affect them and how you can be a great benefit to them. So one of the per perception selling is one of the keystone concepts in my book. Uh, demonstrating proficiency is another. Professionalism is synonymous with value is another. These are the keystone concepts that if you build your practice or business, by the way, it applies to almost all professional services businesses. Okay, it's not just real estate. But these keystone concepts, that's why I call them universal concepts, because they transfer over to a lot of different businesses. But those keystone concepts cause you to be different. And when you're different, people can see that you're different. And when they can see the difference, then you can differentiate yourself from the 1,520,000 agents that are with NAR in the United States, and this causes them to choose you, and that's why you become their choice. And that's why you can win clients for life. And when you can cause them to become raving fans, then you've really scored. Yeah, have you read the book by Ken Blanchard, Raving Fans? It's a great book. You should get it. It's a very small book, but it's a great book. It's called Raving Fans by Ken Blanchard. It's an older book. But it's about how to cause clients to love you, be raving about you. So you mentioned that when you were talking to the client stuff, the story you just uh, mentioned, that they were talking over each other. On the uh, kind of different side of the spectrum, especially with the craziness that's gone on in the last few years, divorce rates have gone through the roof. How do you navigate if you're selling a property for a couple that have broke up and they hate each other? Oh, I'll give you a good story about that one. And as, as a realtor who's been in the business a long time, that happens more than you realize. Uh, I had a couple uh, that were going through a divorce and they the wife called me and asked me to come over to the house with Judy to evaluate their house and tell them what we think it might sell for interview. 
uh, what we would not call the listing presentation, okay? And it, we, we did a two-step approach. We went over and met them first and looked at the house, and then we went back uh, at a later date and did the full presentation. In fact, most of the time we did it at our office. It's a little different than most real estate people do. But in that first, in the first meeting, I got to know her. We looked at the house. In the second meeting, we, we arrived and we went in to sit down and talk about, because they wanted to do it at their home. And the uh, estranged husband came in. And we had not met him before. And this was a very, it was a very expensive home, very large home and very large formal dining room. He sat at one end of the table and she sat at the other end of the table and so there was three or four seats between us and him when he came in a little bit later. And he was absolutely stone-faced. Because what happens is, uh, Rory, is the, 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 the person in the, in the couple that chooses the realtor to interview, the other person always thinks that they don't trust the realtor because the other person chose them. And they're estranged. They're, they're in a lot of conflict. Well... I, I named this man Poker Face because through our meeting and our presentation, he was frozen. I mean, not even blinking an eye. Okay. So we went through the entire presentation and uh, she said to us, okay, I think we're ready to go ahead and list our property. It was about a million five hundred thousand in Texas. That's a big home guy. I mean, that's, that's a large home break. Uh, and uh, we went ahead and started doing the paperwork to list the property. And he interrupted finally and said, first time he spoke, he said, I just want to know, are you going to share with me what you tell her? And I looked at him and I said, uh, Steve, I can promise you we will tell each of you everything that we tell the other one. And I can assure you that Judy and I have both been through divorces we know what it's like. We know how hard it is. We're going to treat you both with great respect. And he didn't even smile, didn't say a word. He said, okay, let's go forward. Now, later on, we found out that Steve was not a poker face. He was a great guy. But everything about that meeting was, was suspect. Everything about that meeting made him worried, distrustful, uncertain. Being a realtor means you have to be, have empathy. You have to be able to relate to people. And so when people ask me what my book is about, it's mostly about people. It's about how to interrelate, you know, communicate with people, how to, how to put people first, how to be a professional in dealing with people. And they both became clients independently. And we helped them both for a number of times. So... Yes, the situation you, you pointed out is, so if a realtor is all focused on the product sale or getting the listing side and not listening to people and understanding their concerns, their fears, their apprehensions, then they're not going to gonna miss the mark. And they're going to make them feel like, I wish I had a different realtor. And of course, some will be able to do that. They'll choose a different realtor. So you, um, I know you've got a blog. You've been blogging for a while. Has the book kind of come from the blogging that you kind of decided to put things together or is it totally separate from? Well, uh, I shared with you that seven, year, seven years ago, Judy suffered a very large stroke. Now, she, she's good now. She can, she can walk with a cane, and, but she can't work, okay? And it changed our lives dramatically. Unlike what we had planned for our lives, things happen and your life changes dramatically. Well, one of the things I did, I wanted to write the book because I'm at a point in my life where I don't want to work 60, 70 hours a week. I wanted to share with others how to be successful in real estate because there are a very high percentage of people who go into real estate who fail. And I wanted to share that information and I wanted to share what I did and how I, how I developed a real estate practice that would make a lot of money over a long period of time and be very successful and most importantly, provide great value and benefit to our clients. And so that's why I wrote the book. And then when I started writing the book, the goal was to create something that was more of a textbook because a lot of the, a lot of the training you get in real estate is how to write a contract, how to uh, show property from, how to use systems to find property. There's very little in training about real estate about how to relate to people. 
And there's all very little in training for real estate where you take a test and you pass the test, et cetera, that is really about how to run a business, how to market yourself, how to differentiate yourself. And so I thought that people should be given a better chance to be successful in real estate. And that's why I wrote the book. Uh, the, the book is, uh, it, one of them, the people who read the book, a very, very, uh, successful billionaire who read the book said to me, Sonny, you realize that you're sharing everything, all your trade secrets, everything that you've done. And I said, yes, sir, I, I realize that. And he said, well, why? I said, because I want to help people. So the book is about how to build a real estate practice, professional practice that will be profitable and sustain itself through ups and downs in the marketplace and will give a person the higher probability of being successful over a long period of time in the real estate profession, whether it's residential or commercial or whatever the case might be. And how relevant is it to have kind of partnerships in place, like the funding, or do you keep away from that? Because like here in Poland, it was kind of, you, you could have a, like you'd recommend a bank and then you'd, you'd get a kickback for that. But you were trying to get the best deal from anyway that they wouldn't do. So like you were telling them, look, go for this interest rate that they would never in a million years get. You're giving your advice. But because the banks were happy you're bringing it, you're getting like a 1% on it. Is that something that you'd encourage or stay awake? I wouldn't do that. Uh, I, would, I wouldn't take a uh, referral fee for helping a client choose a bank for helping a client choose an inspector, for helping a client do something. Uh, I wouldn't take a referral fee on anything that would be contradictory to the relationship that I have with my client. That's not putting the client first. Yeah. I mean, I you know, there's two sides. Yeah. That's something I wouldn't do myself either. But this is something that they're charging like an arrangement fee anyway, and you're getting them the best deal with your experience on it. And that, but I get, I get what you're saying because I know sometimes people are guiding someone to get a service and you're paying twice the price and they're doing it because they're getting the kickback. Like the doctor is doing it pre with the medication and far. Oh, I agree. I agree. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a problem. Now, I'll give you an example of how it's supposed to work. This is how it's supposed to work. I have a client right now who's building a $2 million home. Okay. And I help them find the builder, find the lot, all the things that you do to, to, to build this home. It's a very nice home. In, in, in our area, $2 million home is uh, 5,000 square feet and uh, luxurious. Okay? <laughs> now, this particular builder informed me after I brought the client to them that there was a $10,000 bonus for the agent for bringing the client to them. Now, this is exactly what you're describing, right? All right. Now, so I have an option. I can take the bonus and not tell the client. I could decline the bonus. Or I could tell the client and let the client decide what happens with the bonus. So what would you do? I'm usually kind of transparent in what I'm doing. So I told the client, I called them up and I said, I'm going to use her name. I said, listen, in this, I just found out that in this transaction, I didn't know this until now, that there's a $10,000 bonus to the agent for you buying and building on that particular lot. It's an incentive. And the incentive is available to any agent who brings the client to that lot. It's not just me. Now, I would like to know if you have a problem with me receiving the bonus, because if you do have a problem with me receiving the bonus, I will give the bonus to you. What do you think she said? Let's say she said keep it. She did. Yeah. Now, I fulfilled my fiduciary responsibility to my client. Yeah. I kept my standard of excellence in my, in my business. And I won. Now, why did the client give me the $10,000 bonus? I had helped the client several times before buy and sell property. Okay? And they loved me, and they wanted me to be their agent. And they wanted me to be successful. They want me to make money. In fact, they want to share me with their sphere of influence. Because 
I do a great job and I put the client first. So the reason there, if you, if you're as an agent are confident that you have provided a level of service that's benchmarked, that's better than other people, and that you've always put your client first, usually your client will want you to be successful and be winning. Okay. Now, have I had someone say to me, I want the bonus? Yes. And I gave him the bonus. Okay. Because it, I would not turn it back to the person, the builder. Why would I do that? I would either give it to my client or they would, or my client would agree to let me keep it. So one thing, the hardest thing for a person to do when they go into real estate and they need to make money, Roy, I mean, they're in there to try to make money. Maybe they have six months of staying power. Maybe they can be in business for six months and not have a paycheck. And when they see a $10,000 check, it's very difficult for a person to say, I'm going to forego that money and give it to you because they need it. They want it. They think they've earned it, but they have to put the client first. Kickback situation is, is, I remember one development I was doing and we had project managers that I'd done some projects with, had a good relationship with them and an architect that I'd done some stuff. And the project managers told me that the architect had said, let's work out ways of creating extras there so we can make more money. And he tipped me off. Uh -huh. So I never used that architect again. But it's like, there's a lot of kind of seeing how they can milk milk the client. They don't look at the kind of lot. Like uh -huh. when, when I came to Poland, I actually kind of rocked the boat because they were charging both the buyer and the seller. And like I was charging just the seller, not the buyer, a percentage. And that's how I actually managed to, to, to get a lot of properties but by doing that and, you know, making sure. But there was people that, that that's the way. And they're still even doing that to, to this day. They're charging both sides. Well, I think the one fundamental obligation of an agent is that when they're made aware of something that's a bonus or you're calling it a kickback. Believe me, there's a lot of bonuses for showing property that are available to anyone who shows the property. It's not like a bribe, Okay. It's it, it's in it, sometimes it's even published uh, on the on the internet somewhere that they're paying a bonus, but I think that the fundamental obligation in, in the the code of ethics basically it's it's your responsibility to to disclose any money you receive from an outside source that might cause you to choose or recommend something. Now, if you were a listing uh, client and you had your home on the market for three or four months and you were getting no activity. And you said to me, Sonny, I need to get this property sold. Uh, how do I get this property sold? Uh, I might suggest to you that we reduce the price, right? And I might suggest to you that we uh, provide an allowance for closing expenses to the buyer. That would be a, something you could offer, right? But you could also offer a bonus to the agent who brings the client. Now, you are the seller and it's your property and you want it sold. It's no longer performing for you. It's, it, it's a non-performing asset in your portfolio. Okay, And you want that property sold. You want to get your money out of it and you want to go down the road. Now, you don't. We, if you reduce the price, that may or may not work. And if you offer closing expenses or sales expenses to the buyer, that might not work. But if you want to get more traffic to tour your home, a bonus to the agent might work. So are there times when a client would choose to pay a bonus that's not under the table, not not something wrong? Okay? That's not a kickback. No, absolutely. It's no, no, that's that. That's, that's, and so that's, where I'm headed with this is, as long as the agent who represents that client is ethical and above board and they disclose that money to their client, then it's all fine. And by the way, uh, anytime a client says to you, agent, you're getting this extra money for bringing me to this property. I want it. The agent should give it to them. Because it's only the right thing to do. Now, are there people who don't do that? Absolutely. In any business, that happens. 
And I mean, if you do it the way that you've mentioned, I can understand why you've got long-term plans. Yeah, sorry, I, I stepped on you there, talked over you. But the, one of the things that you've got to remember is when you get an agent who is starving and they are desperate for a sale and you hire them to help you, uh, what do you expect? They want to make, they got to make them, they got to make some money. Okay. So, well, I guess what I'm saying is if you give somebody uh undue, uh, unusual incentive to do something wrong, some of them will do it. Yeah. So what I'd say is always think about is the, is the agent who's working with me going to put me first in all matters. Now I'll give you another quick example. If we have time. Yes. I was showing a client a property, and it was a million-plus property. And he was talking to the owner in a language that I didn't speak. And they had a very nice conversation. It was, they were getting along beautifully. And my client came and said to me, I think I want to buy this home. And by the way, this story is in my book. And I said, can we speak privately for a minute? He said, sure. So I got him away from the seller. And we went and looked at the outside of the home. And I showed him around the windows and the frames of the house that there were cracks that had not been sealed. And that water could have penetrated into those cracks. Now, this particular home had synthetic stucco. Now, synthetic stucco is foam board. And foam board is highly conducive to mold. Now, I explained to my client that if he loved this house and he wanted to buy this home, then we should require the seller to provide proof prior to contracting that the home had no mold issues. And that would protect my client from buying a home that had mold. And the term, the term for that is called stocky botrys, which is another term for black mold, okay? And it's a very dangerous thing here in the Texas, especially in heat, okay? Uh, heat and moisture. My client, we got back in the car afterwards and we left. And he said to me, Sonny, the seller and I were talking. And he said to me, why don't you dump your agent and give me a price and we'll deduct his fee. And you and I can do the deal together without him. Okay. And I said, I would always release you from me if that were the case. He said, no, I'm not going to do that with him. That's not appropriate. He didn't buy the house. He never called the guy back who kept calling him. And we went and found him another home where there was no risk of mold. That's how it's supposed to work. Okay. So when you talk about the, the, the first measure of a realtor is what? their ethics. That's the first measure. Now, if they don't have ethics and you don't trust them, you should not work with them. That may be you have to look harder for a realtor. So when you look out there and you see that, by the way, when you, the term for this is when you see all these people who look alike, sound alike, and act alike, alike they're called ubiquitous. They all basically are the same. Okay. Now, who wouldn't want a lower price if they're all the same? Right? So when you, when you see all of them are the same, but the difference is that when an agent can demonstrate to you skills and talents far above the average and that they are different and better and they can show you and prove to you by demonstrating proficiency and displaying to you characteristics that indicate that they're ethical, that's the agent you should choose. Excellent, excellent. This has gone a direction I fully didn't expect to go, but it's very intriguing and very interesting. I totally enjoyed it. And another one that I've seen a lot of time, and I'm sure you have as well. When a property isn't selling, 95% if not even more of agents drop the price. It don't change their marketing style. Or like what the example you gave of giving uh, the other agents a, a, a percentage for actually bringing somebody in. What's the best thing for that when the people are trying to 
drop the price. Drop the price. All right. Well, first of all, let's talk about. Uh, do you play poker? Do you, do you ever play cards? Not much. I, I have. Okay. Play, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right. okay. So I want you to think about the options in a real estate transaction are like a, a deck of cards. Okay? One card is price reduction. One card is improving the property. One card is offering incentives to the buyer. One card is offering a bonus to the agents. to Get more traffic. If you have more traffic, you probably have a higher chance of selling all of them, right? The more people look at it, the more chance it is going to sell. Uh, and there are other things like doing uh, improvements, offering uh, to pay certain closing costs. There, there's, oh, eight or ten different cards you could play. And most realtors are, they might use one card only, the king, okay? The king of hearts. And that's a price reduction. And that's all they know how to play. And so they always say to you, Let's reduce the price. I mean, it's not selling at five hundred thousand. Let's reduce it to four hundred and seventy-five thousand. And then, when it doesn't sell at four seventy-five, it's let's reduce it to four fifty. At some point, it would sell, right? If you kept reducing the price, okay. But that doesn't necessarily benefit the seller. Okay. So, how do you get the maximum benefit for the seller? Well, first of all, it's by pricing it correctly in the very beginning. And some sellers encourage an agent to overprice a property because the agent's so desperate to get it listed and get a sign in the yard that they'll raise the price to get the listing, and that's a mistake, too. Or they are saying that the price is worth this just to get the well, job. Well, maybe they say the price should be 475 and you, the seller, insist, I want 500 and I'm not selling it for a penny less. And then three months later, the agent says, you should reduce it to 475 That's what I told you would sell for anyway. And then maybe they'll drop it, okay? So you got to have an agent who would give you a, a truth. So here's the way we work with clients. Roy, we think your home will sell for somewhere between four hundred and seventy-five and $500,000, this range. We don't know. No, way, no agent knows what the home will sell for. They have a suspicion. They might even have data points that say it'll sell for this. But the economy, the buyer are all different, and so things change. So we have a choice here where you can list it at 500 or more. But we don't know that that will sell at that price. Now, if you go at 475 it's logical that a lower price would probably sell more quickly, but there's no guarantee. But we can tell you that with our marketing program, and, our, and we do a very good job of marketing presentation, this is a... What I've done with you today is a lot different than what we do. Our actual presentation is an hour to an hour and 20 minutes long. And it's very much focused on marketing. Okay. If we demonstrate to you that our marketing program is the best in the marketplace, in the industry, and we believe in our ethics, and then we give you this decision because it's your home, up to list at 500 or 475 or 515. And if you list it at five fifteen, we'll do everything possible to sell it at the highest possible price in the shortest period of time. Okay, but if it doesn't sell within thirty days, we ask you to let's do a review. That's the way we approach it. Now that's a collaborative approach, rather than I'm the all-knowing agent who tells you what to do. And most people don't like that. I bet, I bet when you're looking at working with a realtor and they start telling you what to do, I bet you don't like that, Roy. Am I right? Well, I kind of, I know myself by actually researching the market and look, and I know, I kind of know which guys are, are just trying to try it out, like I'm trying to get a fast sale. Now you're an experienced buyer and seller, and so you have more experience. A first time home buyer or seller has a different perspective because they don't have the experience that you have. And unfortunately, Many times. Oh, here's another good one. Uh, you interview with someone and they say, well, I have a relative who's a realtor. Or I have a great friend who's a realtor. One of my best friends is a real estate agent. And I, I'm thinking I want to list with them. I said, how important is the relationship with that person? Uh, well, it's pretty important. Would you be willing to fire them? No. 
uh, wouldn't want to, well, then maybe you should choose someone who's not a relative or a friend to list your home with so that you can be objective and take the action necessary to achieve your objective. Because a lot of people list their homes with a friend. And then when that friend doesn't do the job they expected, isn't getting the results they want, they have to figure out what to do, and it's uncomfortable. And one of the hardest ones is uh, someone who says, well, there's a member of our church who, who's a realtor, and I'm going to list my home with them. So when that doesn't work out, how great is that? To go to church every week, and there's the person that you fired or you couldn't, you had to terminate the relationship with, who is sitting in the pew next to you, that's unpleasant. Make a good business decision. Choose someone that you, you've interviewed and talked to. Choose someone who you uh, understood and identified their skill sets and who you believe is the most competent and the most able to demonstrate that they can do the job for you. Someone who can explain to you the strategy of when we, we don't sell in a certain price time. In a certain time frame. Okay. And I know where I could talk to you for hours on this because it's uh, 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 nice, fascinating. No, listen, I've got as much time as you and your, <laughs> and your listeners need. Uh, one thing I'll say about the book that's quite different, though, and you would find it, uh, I think, intriguing, is that there's over 5,000 words of scripts in the book. These scripts are what you say in certain circumstances and how you talk as a real estate professional. And the discussion we've been having is a lot like that. It's what is the script? I've been role-playing with you at various times saying, here's what I would say. There's 5,000 words in the, of scripts in the book. The book is also a highly interactive. If you're reading about differentiation and you want to know what I'm saying about that particular thing, there's a QR code that you can click on. It'll take you to my YouTube video about differentiation. Okay? It's an interactive book in that regard. The book's in color. It's 300 pages. It's a hardback. It's not your typical real estate book. It's not about how to get become a millionaire overnight. It's not about how easy it is to be in real estate. You know how a lot of people get into real estate, Roy? A lot of they're riding around with a realtor, and the realtor says, you know, Roy, you would be a great real estate agent. And the, the client says, really? How hard is it to be an agent? And the person says, oh, you just study. You take a test. You pass the test, you join a good brokerage firm, and you're in business. And they go into real estate. Maybe they've never, you know, they went through college and university, and maybe their job was in marketing, or maybe their job was in the high-tech field, or maybe their job was in personnel, or maybe they were a teacher. But they didn't learn all the skill sets necessary to run a business. They understood the real skill sets necessary to do what they were doing in that particular track or that particular uh, uh, thing that they were they were working in. So a lot of people leave a technology career, for example, thinking, well, I'm high tech. I really know technology. I can go into real estate and I can be hugely successful. But they don't know a thing about interpersonal communications and how to build relationships with people and how to capture people. They don't know how to cast a net over someone and capture them long enough to make that perception sell. They don't know how to, how to capture someone long enough to demonstrate proficiency. And so one of the keystone concepts is casting the marketing net. How do you cast a net over someone, capture them long enough that you can make a, per, a perception sell, demonstrate competency, competency, and prove that you're better and you're different? And that's what marketing in real estate is all about. It's not about selling thousands of homes to different people who are unrelated. It's about selling homes to people who are, maybe they referred you to a lot of other people. Maybe their sphere of influence was open to you and they referred you to all of their friends because they want their friends to benefit the way they benefited. That's what real estate's about. And I hope that through my podcast and my book that I can help people not go into real estate with misconceptions of how easy it's going to be how they're going to become wealthy overnight. They're going to drive around in a beautiful car and take people to the country club, have wonderful luncheons, and then go to, to the closing table and celebrate someone buying a new home or selling a home or acquiring an investment portfolio that is substantially uh, positive.
you know, if you buy enough properties, you'll find one that's not good, right? And if you only buy one property, there's a 50-50 chance it'll be good or bad. So there's a lot of things about real estate that people need to know. That's why someone who has a general education, who has knowledge of a lot of different things, is, is, can really be successful in real estate. Another misconception is that people have to be highly expressive and that an introvert, someone who is very quiet, cannot be successful in real estate. And that's not true. A, highly qu a very quiet person who's very introverted, very analytical, can be highly successful in real estate if they learn to bend and be more personal and work with clients who are also very private, very analytical. It's a perfect match. Listen, Sonny, totally enjoyed this. And I actually, I definitely want to read your book and then get you back because you've shared some uh, some beautiful tips today. So you well, can... Ingram Spark will be marketing it internationally. Uh, they have uh, supply outlets in all over the all over Europe, and uh, that's the reason I chose them to help put the book out. So starting on the twenty eighth, they'll be starting to distribute the book through their various outlets, and then and then uh, it's uh, it's going to come out in print form only in the beginning, and then it'll be coming out in uh, 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 maybe an ebook soon. Uh, I'm having a hard time doing an uh, a, that, uh, a voice copy of it because. I'm not sure it's too, it's very complex. So I'm not sure it's, it will go over well with a, with a voice presentation of it. I'm sure with their experience, they'd advise anyway, because they'll know some kind of, you know, what, what they're doing, whether it, it should be, because sometimes it doesn't work when it's an audio book. Oh, I agree. Audio books. And that's why I'm having a hard time because the scripts have to be done where you can see who's talking. And there's a lot of scripts in the book. I mean, a lot like we've had today. I've given you a, eight or 10 scripts. So, uh, the book itself, you can go to my website at sunnymoreyours.com, which is my real estate website. You can go to realestatebook.org, O-R-G, and that's the book website. You can go to my uh, channel on YouTube, The Architecture of the Real Estate Practice. That's rather long, but if you go to The Architecture of the Real Estate Practice, you'll find uh, my YouTube channel, and you also can just just look on YouTube. I have a lot of videos out there and a lot of a lot of things out there about the book that you can read. And then you can just Google Sonny Moyer's Realtor Dallas, and I think there's a, there's a lot of realtors in Dallas, um, thousands. Because Dallas is a hotbed of real estate. It's very very big right now. How did I become the number one realtor in Dallas for that year? I was different. And I demonstrated to a panel of experts that I was unique and different and that I had my client put the first in everything I did. And so I won the Realtor of the Year, what's called the McSam Award for 2015 uh, by the Dallas Builders Association because of the psychology and the approaches that I take. Uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed our interview. Okay, thanks, Sonny. I'll back back. We can talk uh, again. Uh, absolutely. As I mentioned, I, I, I definitely want to read the book. When I've read the book, then we come back and we go even deeper. And I'll make sure I'll put all the links to the, the two websites and the YouTube channel that you mentioned. Okay. All right, great. Thank you so much. And uh, good luck to your audience. And I hope they're very successful in whatever their real estate endeavors might be. Thanks very much. Hey, so that's all for the Speaking Podcast. You'll find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com. Until next week, take care. So I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. As mentioned at the start, you'll find my six podcasts on buyer.link forward slash podcaster. And also, if you'd like to start a podcast or do a podcasting tour, you'll find the information on that or on the QR code that's there. Be sure to give us a thumbs up, five star rating, and share with your friends because it really helps. Until next week, take care.